Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Pelicast. My name is Daniel Erspommer. I'm the CEO of the Pelican Institute, and we have a great program uh, for you coming up in just a minute to cover um, a topic that certainly has been uh, leading the conversation around uh, the upcoming legislative session. And certainly if you've been engaged here with the Pelican Institute over the last couple of years, you years you've heard a lot about tax reform and you're going to hear a lot more coming up before we dive in uh to our pelicast today i want to note a couple of things the first um you may hear a little bit of background noise we have a busy day here at pelican institute hq uh, we have our uh, class of the pelican leadership academy uh, happening today um this is the second class of a year-long program. Uh, be on the lookout this summer and fall to apply uh, for next year's program. It's a great intensive course uh, on leadership, public policy, and the political process here in Louisiana. So apologies for any background noise. We have some really excited and engaged leaders uh, here in the office today. Also, if you haven't seen it yet, March 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, uh, will be our big solutions mini summits. So those of you who've been with us for a while know we would typically around now be uh, be talking about our solution summit in person, setting up the big issues facing the state of Louisiana and uh, discussing so, uh, what are those solutions and, and what will be, do, uh, be happening in the legislative session. Unfortunately, the pandemic prevents us uh, from being able to all be in person but there's some opportunity in that too. That means a lot more people, you and your friends and neighbors can join us for that. So we'll do a couple of hours for three days. Make sure to save the date, March 22nd, 23rd and 24th. We'll be diving deeply into tax reform. We'll be talking about technology and innovation and how do we make Louisiana the innovation capital of the country. Uh, and, uh, and of course, we'll be diving uh, fully in uh, to education policy as well. How do we ensure every child in Louisiana has the opportunity to attend a school that fits him or her? So big things coming up. Registration is going to open up on Monday. So look for that. Look for some contests you can join and, uh, and get involved for some discount codes. Anyway, it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to want to be there. Uh, March 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. Big solutions, mini summits. We'll have some fun. All right, uh, let's dive in. Again, we're talking about tax reform. This is going to be a big deal. It is a big deal. Uh, so if you want your friends and neighbors and your networks uh, to, uh, to hear more about this and to be engaged in the conversation, just go ahead and hit that share button in the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, so that uh, this shows up in your feed and and uh, can be viewed by uh, lots of people across the state of Louisiana. It's going to take all of us coming together to get this done, and you'll hear a little bit about that in a minute. So as we think about tax reform, we look around the country and say, what states are doing this well? Um, as we all know, Louisiana has its uh, unique uh, little quirks and, and challenges, uh, particularly when it comes to tax law. Um, and uh, But we can look to other states and see who does this really well. And the state that really has uh, been a shining leader in tax reform in the last decade or so uh, is the state of North Carolina. And so we thought instead of us telling you about it, we'd hear exactly what happened right uh, from the leaders of that effort in North Carolina. So we have two great guests with us and uh, they'll join us here on the Pelicast. The first is uh, Representative Dean Arp, who is the senior chairman of the Appropriations Committee uh, in the legislature in the House, uh, State House, North Carolina. He represents District 69, which is Union County, North Carolina. Representative Arp, thank you so much for being with us. It's great to be on with you, Daniel. Appreciate the opportunity. Excellent. You bet. And joining Representative Arp will be Brian Balfour. And Brian is the Senior Vice President of Research at the John Locke Foundation, North Carolina's free market think tank. And uh, in that role, he oversees all of the research and analysis of, of all of the issues uh, that the John Locke Foundation covers and on which they lead and tax reform, certainly uh, one of those issues. Brian, really appreciate you being with us today. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Appreciate uh, uh, the discussion today. 
Absolutely. So guys, let's dive right in. Can you um, can you just walk us through when did tax reform happen? Uh, what happened and really what was the impetus? What what kicked off this effort? And uh, Representative Art, maybe you can you can kick off that answer and, and Brian, feel free to jump in as well. Absolutely. Well, back in uh, back in uh, 2010, we were just uh, in the middle of just a, one of the worst recessions coming out of there. Uh, we we had a three billion dollar budget uh, hole. Uh, we owed three billion dollars to the uh, federal government for unemployment insurance that we had borrowed against to pay our unemployment rates, and we were in a dismal position. In fact, I'm a small business owner, and one of the reasons why I ran for office in 2012 was because of this challenge that we were having, and I just didn't think our, our state government was oriented right for economic growth and, and just on the right principles. And so uh, that was really the kickoff uh, and had a big change uh, in 2010. Uh, Republicans took over the House uh, and Senate uh, and and started the change. At that time, we had a graduated uh, uh, personal income tax uh, from that was from six to seven and a half percent or seven and three quarters percent, and and we just uh, believe very strongly in a flat tax, uh, and so we just began the hard work uh, of uh, fiscal discipline and just uh, really holding to the financial principles uh, that are so key to effectively managing the state government and really every fund. We were excited about it. That, that was the impetus that kind of kicked us off, Daniel. And uh, Boy, that sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> well, what it does is it creates the background uh, where you fear that you can't lower taxes or do tax reform. And, and I'm here to tell you uh, that you have to believe in the principles and you have to believe strongly, uh, walk boldly, and courageously, and, uh, and it worked. Uh, I'm telling you, uh, 10 years later, uh, we are, are in some of the best places because of the decisions we made 10 years ago. Uh, you just can't short circle financial governing principles. Yeah, and I'll just Absolutely. jump in and add, add on a, a little more context to, to what uh, Representative Arp was talking about there. So by 2010, uh, North Carolina uh, had the eighth highest unemployment rate in the country. Um, and, and for the previous, for the decade leading up to 2010, uh, our median personal income growth was lagging behind the national average growth rate, which had reversed a, a basically about a two decades long trend. So things were already, even before the Great Recession hit, things were trending in the wrong direction in North Carolina economically, um, which you know just added to the urgency for tax reform. And, and then uh, North Carolina's tax uh, structure and, and tax code, as, as Representative was mentioning, was among the worst in the country. Uh, by 2013, when, when the big reforms really hit North Carolina, North Carolina was rated by the Tax Foundation as the seventh worst business tax climate in the country. Uh, our, our top personal income tax rate was highest in the Southeast, I think 10th or 11th highest in the country. Our corporate income tax rate was also highest in the Southeast. So, you know, we kind of had a reputation as a, a high tax state in a low tax region. So, you know, they, a lot of these forces were really combining to, to create some urgency to do something to improve our tax climate. That's so important. And, you know, I think uh, I think we're seeing some of the same challenges here uh, in Louisiana and, and really a sin, uh, the, the biggest sin, in my opinion, of the tax code is uh, is just incredible complexity, not only in terms of uh, of a graduated rate, but also in terms of just you know, one of the, the most stunning stats we like to talk about is uh, the, the corporate tax rate in particular in Louisiana has 432 pages of tax preferences and deductions. And, you know, I think that uh, relates to somewhere around 180 pages. It takes uh, the King James version of the Bible to, to complete the New Testament. Um, but we have 432 pages of 
of tax preferences in the corporate tax code alone. And, you know, just it's to, to navigate that, the cost of compliance even uh, is incredibly high. One of the things, Daniel, that we've done as part of the tax reform was to simplify the code, get rid of deductions as the rates came down. Uh, you know, we, we had to struggle through that. And what are you know what are the what are the deductions and as the rates go down the deductions became clear we, we were clearly focused on a simpler straightforward tax code uh, that was both fair uh, and uh, incentivizes the business you know, not, not a distance you know if, if we could uh, I, you know this this seems like one of the challenges and I'd love to hear how you navigated it in North Carolina you know, when you have such complexity, when you have so many deductions and preferences and, you know, industry carve outs and, you know, the, the groups for whom they they benefit from those, the groups that benefit from those and, and who get the most uh, most out of it, they don't want their ox to be gored. Um, and so there has to be some trust that they're going to end up better <laughs> on the other side with a, a simpler, more predictable, flatter rate. How did you navigate those? How, how, how did you... Uh, you know, give us a little color about how the debate went down. Well, well, first of all, I never ask uh, the public to trust a politician. Okay, so, <laughs> <laughs> so what's going on with that? Fair, fair. And, and, <laughs> but uh, one of the things that we uh, really did have to do is uh, the, the the public really was um, fed up, or if you will, frustrated with the policies that got us there. As Ryan was. Sharon, uh, we were at a pivotal point in North Carolina where the economy wasn't getting better by doing the same old things. And so we had bold and fresh ideas about that. And, and that's really what led us into uh, office uh, to, for the first time in 140 years, we were able to take both chambers in the, in the House. And then, then two years later, we took the governor. Uh, but it was really about the strength of ideas on how to restart the economy. Uh, we started uh, lowering uh, the taxes. The first thing we did was the uh, flat income tax uh, there. And it's been a decades long process. It's not uh, one thing, it's a continual, continual push. It was a continual push. Um, we went uh, from 5.8% now down to five and a quarter percent. Now that doesn't seem like a big rate change, but that represents almost 50 to 60% of our total tax revenue is in our personal income tax. And so it's significant. We're actually uh, uh, have saved over the last uh, 10 years, uh, almost $2.8 billion uh, year, per year uh, uh, savings on this. Huh. Our, between our personal income tax, our uh, sales tax, our uh, corporate franchise, all of that together, we're almost $3.4 billion in tax savings than we were 10 years ago. And and with that, our revenues were up 36%. Uh, huh. We went in 2012, we had revenues of $20.2 billion. Our revenues this year, right coming out of the pandemic was $27.6 billion. Huh. And so um, it, it is the numbers um, prove themselves. Uh, but what we had to do is put a responsible plan and what I call a glide path. And we used uh, a mechanism called triggers, uh, trigger mechanisms and so forth that help lower the rate. The worst thing that I felt my colleagues were afraid of during that time were, were we're not going to cover the revenue expenses that we needed to, uh, I mean, the expenses we needed to cover with our revenue. And so I would tell you that a key piece of tax reform is spending reform and budget mm -hmm. control. Uh, we had both uh, in line. And, and while we don't have a TABOR, a Taxpayer Bill of Rights, or if you will, uh, growth plus inflation. That was certainly um, uh, a mechanism, a touchstone that we use and still use today as we look at our spending side. We, we don't, in other words, we don't look at just how much money is coming in and spend everything we have. 
we control the spending side so that we can also control the tax rate. And with that, we've had phenomenal growth. That is such an important piece of the puzzle, I think, that often gets overlooked. Um, and and to that point, uh, you know, for those watching, uh, Louisiana lawmakers will look again as part of the, the package of, of legislation that um, we understand will be introduced. will also include uh, uh, an expenditure limit that passed the legislature last year, fell just short on the ballot, um, but, but perhaps and hopefully as part of a broader reform package um, will help voters and, and taxpayers understand the value um, of measures like that. And, and I think it's so important to hear, you know, from your experience that that's a critical piece uh, of the puzzle. You know, but I'm, I'm curious, uh, maybe start with Brian and then Representative Arp jump in as well. As you looked at um, uh, models, as you were doing research and trying to understand uh, what would work best, how would you both uh, simplify, I presume simplify rates, but, but do it in a way that was demonstrably economic growth positive? That would bring jobs and, and increase economic activity. What did you look at? How did you uh, how did you and other leaders arrive at um, this kind of reform plan? Yeah, from so from our part, uh, from the kind of the think tank angle or, or side of things, is uh, we really dove deep into the research and and uh, actually commissioned a study uh, back at the time with uh, Art Laffer's uh, economic group. And a big part of that study was evaluating and examining um, not just the level of state taxes, and but um, uh, the types of taxes that are most harmful to uh, economic growth. And, and what the evidence was pointing to was that it's the uh, corporate income tax, the personal income taxes that were, were much more harmful. So from that, we were able to really kind of provide some guidelines and some advice that uh, if North Carolina wants to uh, uh, reform their tax code in a pro-growth kind of manner, uh, they really need to get away from the re uh, heavy reliance on the, on the income taxes. So to be really aggressive then of going after those corporate income taxes, personal income taxes, as, as I noted earlier, were, were highest in the Southeast at the time. Um, and so we could make the state far more competitive. So that was really some of the guidelines. And then of course, you know, uh, simplifying the tax code was a, a big emphasis, making it more simple, um, trying to make it as neutral as possible um, so that it's not uh, um, you know, having a distortionary effect on economic activity across the state. So that was really kind of the, uh, um, the emphasis and, and the, the attack that we took. Absolutely. We, one of the key themes as we were uh, listening closely and working together is we do understand how regressive uh, anti-intuition, the, the, the income tax um, deterrent is. And so what we've tried to do is migrate to a much more broader sales tax uh, basis. Um, as part of our income tax reform on the personal side, as we lowered the rates, what we did was increase the deduction, the married filing jointly and all the other deductions for those who would not pay any income. Uh -huh. We raised the floor to uh, combat the argument that we're burdening the lower incomes as we drop the rates. And that was real. And so what we tried to do is raise the standard deduction in North Carolina for those who pay no income tax whatsoever. At the same time, we put in their trigger mechanisms that once we reach certain um, thresholds and so forth of revenue, the corporate rate would, would tick down. And right now, when we started off uh, back in 2010, our corporate rate was 6.9 and now it's 2.5%. Uh, wow. Uh, a significant drop. And we've been able to constantly look at it. I will tell you that it's not one thing that you, you have to keep your eye on all of them. Uh, so, and we had a comprehensive tax policy in North Carolina. Uh, we did not allow lo local governments to increase their taxes and so forth. So we had an effective tax rate that we were managing uh, across the state so that when businesses come, it didn't matter what county they were in, they had a, a low and a lower ring tax rate as we move forward. But it was just it was just phenomenal. Um, 
but it's slow, methodical, year-over-year progress and restrained spending uh, because uh, people get confused and, and concerned that we won't meet the, uh, you know, the revenue uh, right. needs. Uh, and so I can't, I can't stress enough how important um, controlled spending is as well. Well, that's great. And, you know, we've talked a little bit about the rev- the trigger piece a couple of times here. And, and, and Brian mentioned this in the piece. For those of you who haven't seen it, please uh, do check out the Pelican Institute website and get that at pelicaninstitute.org. And we've got a, a guest article from Brian here that explains a lot of what we're talking about today if you want to dig in more. But talk us through what does that mean? So, Let's get let's get a little wonky for a minute here. We'll we'll come back to the high levels, but let's get a little wonky for a minute and talk about what are the revenue triggers and how exactly does that work? Uh, yeah, well, I can uh, just kind of touch on that for a minute. So this, uh, these triggers were actually written into the law uh, when the tax reform was passed. So so what and and they were applied in our case in North Carolina specifically to the corporate income tax rate. So what it did was the original law. I think in the first year it dropped the rate from 6.9 to 6 percent, uh, then scheduled it to drop to 5 percent the following year. And then it re- uh, wrote into the law that in any subsequent years for that rate to drop another, they, they wrote it as another percentage point, full percentage point, that certain revenue targets would have to be met. So it, it actually put into law. So it need uh, so for that year, it needed the, the state needed to raise, you know, X percent or X number of uh, of dollars into the general fund. And that was really kind of a safeguard because there was a, a lot of uncertainty because these, it, it, back in 2013, these tax reforms were historic in nature. They were very significant. So there was a bit of uncertainty still, just exactly how it was going to impact revenues and everything. So uh, it was a, a bit of a safeguard, you know, just in case if revenues are, are maybe tend to fall a little more than maybe we expected, um, you know, let's make sure that revenues are still coming in. Uh, at a healthy pace, uh, you know, sufficient enough to fund the, the core functions of government uh, before uh, the the uh, this corporate tax rate drops any further. So that was really what they were trying to accomplish there. And, and, and fortunately, um, you know, thanks to the reforms that North Carolina's economy was was uh, doing really well, revenues were coming in at a pretty uh, continued robust clip. So those triggers were were implemented. And uh, as Representative uh, our mentioned a minute ago, now North Carolina has dropped all the way down to two and a half percent for the corporate tax rate, which is the lowest of any state in the country that uh, implements one of those taxes. Right. Well, one of the things I remember clearly, Daniel, being in that room uh, as we were debating these things. In fact, the first year is the uh, the most uh, uh, is the scariest year. Yeah, uh, we knew that we were going to see revenue decline when we dropped the rate. We knew it. But our projections had us that the uh, second and third year, we would actually start seeing the income increase. And so uh, politics is not for the weak. It's for the bold. <laughs> and you have to believe and and uh, and you have to believe, believe in, in, in what you're doing. And, uh, and and in fact, what we had in there were a revenue trigger. In fact, one of these was. Um, uh, that we would uh, have to have a $20.9 billion in revenues back in 2015. Well, we blew through that by <laughs> over a billion dollars based on those other uh, uh, mechanisms and the rates. And, and so what happened is we ended up just repealing those uh, revenue triggers and, uh, and the rate is now lower because that was a mechanism for us to get to lower rates and so forth uh, as we, as we, we, for the last thing a, a politician would like to do is give a uh, tax uh, cut and then take it back. <laughs> because, <laughs> That's right. You know, you just, you just don't want to be in that position, but um, it, it was phenomenal on the corporate side in terms of uh, the revenue picture that, that we've seen. And like I said, our revenue is up over uh, 30, 36% uh, from where there was 10 years ago. And, um, and and the other thing I would tell you is that uh, 
North Carolina had a constitutional um, cap of 10% for our personal income tax. And we were able to, as we got a better financial picture, we actually put on the ballot a constitutional amendment to change that to 7%. And so we, as the tax rate came down, uh, we were able to lock that into our constitution and on those downward pressures and so forth. And then, and then finally, the good thing that, that I will tell you politically that we did uh, was we had a tax plan that lowered the rates through these trigger mechanisms without having to pass subsequent bills and go back and fight with the governor and the different things. We had a plan. It was passed and no further action was required once we meet these revenue triggers. Politically, that set the stage on a long arc for these fiscal policies to take place. And so uh, th those are, I I'm incredibly proud of what we were able to do. That was a compromise uh, and, and very significant in uh, where we are today in North Carolina. Boy, that's big. And, and one thing I want to just sort of frame for the viewers, too, is, you know, <laughs> I think it's easy to kind of demagogue the idea of a corporate income tax. Right. We'll we'll let those big corporate fat cats pay the tax and, and you know, no big deal. But I think what we know from <laughs> from tax policy, uh, what I want everyone to remember, anytime anyone says corporate tax, what they mean is jobs tax. Um, the, the people who pay that tax are the customers and the employer, employees uh, of those companies. So if we want, uh, I, I know it's easy to kind of politically to say in you know, a big, big corporate tax, that's fine. Um, but, but I think your experience uh, in North Carolina is just a great example. If we lower the burden to create jobs, if we lower those taxes, um, we get more of them. We get more jobs. We get more economic activity, and that benefits everyone at every income strata across the board. Um, so, corporate tax means job tax. I think is an important thing for folks to remember. Daniel, um, we go ahead. Ahead. So that what, to, to, to your point, the two things that we focused on was the corporate income tax and lowering the unemployment tax. And uh, the unemployment tax was a tax not levied by government, but it was levied on businesses. And so from our standpoint, we had a high unemployment rate. And when we did unemployment tax reform as part of the overall measures to attack this problem and make North Carolina business friendly, that was a revenue free to the state changes but it made a significant impact on our businesses. In other words, it was our businesses paying the unemployment tax in the state that, uh, that when we lowered and changed that in, a cor in, in conjunction with the corporate income tax, it really impacted positively our businesses. And, and we saw growth as a result of that. Boy, Can you tell well, I'm excited, Daniel? <laughs> I love it. I love it. Here's what I'm looking forward to. When we get through this session, let's get back and we'll bring some of uh, Louisiana's uh, legislative champions and bring you and some of your colleagues and we'll have a celebration about uh, about how you helped us get tax reform here in Louisiana. I love it. So so let's talk about those outcomes. I mean, you, we've kind of hinted at it. We've talked about the growth in uh, in state revenues, but talk about if you could, um, and either of you that wants to, to sort of jump in first, um, what did people experience? You know, as as the as the tax rates uh, became simpler and lower, and and you started to see economic growth, were they positive? What did the economy do? What did jobs do? Just just paint a picture for us of um, what the results ultimately for for everyday folks across North Carolina. Yeah, and I, I can jump in here real quick, um, just on a couple measures that uh, that I, I did some background research on. Um, you know, unemployment is down uh, noticeably uh, in North Carolina. So, so doing some comparison, I had mentioned earlier that in 2010, uh, North Carolina was was struggling with the eighth highest unemployment rate uh, in the country. Um, by uh, well. And then by uh, February of 2020, which is before all the COVID lockdowns started, um, kind of throw out the data after that. That's uh, just a, a wild card. Uh, but uh, as of February February 2020, 
Uh, North Carolina's unemployment rate had fallen to uh, just 3.8%, where it had been uh, uh, over 10% uh, a decade prior. So significant advances there. Um, North Carolina, instead of having the eighth highest in the nation unemployment rate, uh, it was only the 17th highest. You know, still still more work to do, but uh, both in absolute terms and relative terms, you know, significant improvements uh, in terms of jobs and unemployment. Uh, and then also uh, what's uh, even more remarkable, I think, is the household income. Uh, I looked at some of the numbers with regards to median household income uh, in North Carolina. Uh, our median household income grew by 47.2 percent uh, uh, hmm. from 2012 as the baseline year, the year before the major tax reforms here uh, to 2019, the latest uh, full year with the uh, data available. So that growth rate of 47.2 uh, percent over those years, uh, that's easily the highest in the southeast above all of our neighboring and regional yeah. states and still significantly outpacing the national average of that time of about uh, 34, 35%. So, you know, unemployment's down, more people are working, uh, income is up. So, you know, uh, uh, you know, largely attributed to the, the significant improvement in North Carolina's tax climate. Um, I mentioned uh, before the Tax Foundation had us at uh, I think seventh worst in the country as of their latest rankings in 2021, we're now 10th best in the country. So, you know, investment and job creation goes where it's welcomed. And when you have a yeah. more hospitable tax climate, like we've uh, worked so hard to get here in North Carolina, you know, the results uh, speak for themselves. And, and Representative Arp, as you've, uh, you know, I, you've run for re-election since this, and, you know, you and your colleagues have talked to voters. What's the, you know, if I'm a lawmaker, I'm, I may be thinking about the political ramifications uh, of taking a this is bold action. This is big. What's your what's been your and your colleagues' experience on this? Well, I will tell you, like I've mentioned before, the first years are the the scariest, and uh, they're not for the faint-hearted. Uh, we had uh, predictions that eighty percent, uh, you know, uh, fail in this the tax burden is shifting down. Our revenues are going to, and it's just a doomsday. Uh, and uh, and quite frankly. Uh, it just didn't pan out. Uh, the, the numbers actually work. Uh, and what happened, uh, like I said, the, we, we had real wage growth. Uh, and so on every metric that you uh, measure, uh, we, 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 these policy changes affected positive growth. And what became uh, as a part of the political discourse, it was, the the fear mongering and the fear uh was was subdued and changed by the year over year uh, outstanding performance uh we we used to be worried about deficits and all the time of course we have to balance our books we don't print right. money uh, uh <laughs> but um, uh but the revenue growth was phenomenal and by actually dropping rates and having the right tax policy I mean, because quite frankly, citizens want to participate and pay for good government that is responsible and does what government's supposed to do. But we have to keep government in the business of doing the thing that government is supposed to do and not anything else. And so those pro provide hard decisions about spending as well as uh, very carefully uh, taxing our citizens to meet those needs. They're very willing to invest in education and health and things like that when they know that you're responsibly spending their money. And that's a trust yeah. that you hold with the public. I never go up to my constituents and say, trust me, I'm a politician. <laughs> but <laughs> what I do say is you don't have to trust me. Just look at our, our performance, our policies, our year over year stuff, and we're going to make decisions that's right for you and your family. I believe that you can spend your money more wisely than we can. We're going to take just the right amount, just the bare minimum, provide those services for what we want government to be. And that's the compact we have with our citizens. On that side. Well, that's terrific. Well, gentlemen, we're about to the end of our time, but I want to ask uh, each of you for some sort of final thoughts and lessons learned. If you can speak uh, to some degree directly to the uh, to the voters and citizens here of Louisiana. And uh, we've got lawmakers watching as well. 
Um, what's your advice? What's lessons learned? Uh, they're going to gavel in and in just a few weeks and tackle these issues. What, what, what would you like to tell them? Uh, well, I'll just go ahead and say, um, you know, taxes might not be everything, but state taxes still matter. Uh, they, they matter quite a bit to your state's economic health. And, and by that, I, I mean, you know, most importantly is getting people back to work, uh, better job opportunities, more job opportunities, better paying jobs for, for the economic financial security of, of the families in, in, uh, in Louisiana. Uh, and also uh, more directly to the legislators there, um, spending, the spending side of things is so critical. Um, if you keep spending in check, that enables you to, to be much more aggressive with the tax reform uh, that, that uh, is so critical to uh, bettering the tax climate for your state. So, you know, keep that spending in check, keep the spending under control, that the growth rates, you know, year over year growth rates, try to keep it to, uh, um, uh, you know, the, those TABOR limits, the, uh, the annual population plus inflation growth. We, we've done that here in North Carolina for the last several years and it's really yielded, yielded outstanding results. We've had multiple, I think we're about six or seven years straight of significant budget surpluses, even as the tax rates continue to fall. So, you know, it can be done. Uh, and, and uh, you know, it, it's not always easy to get done politically, but it's worth it. It's worth it in the end, it's worth it. And, and your citizens, the people in North Carolina, the hardworking families and entrepreneurs there, uh, they worth, they're worth it and they deserve it. That's right. And, and, we, and we work in a great uh, uh, conjunction with uh, uh, citizens and advocacy groups and so forth. And I just can't thank uh, John Locke and, and people like yourself, uh, Daniel, who provide a platform to have these types of discussions. I will tell you, as a, it, it seems uh, sappy in some ways, but as, as political leaders, our job is to lead and that's to cast a vision of what can be and then boldly and faithfully believe in uh, that you can get there and lead there. And, and that's not, that's not, uh, that's not uh, a small thing to do. We have to cast the vision and uh, put checks, uh, famous uh, president check, uh, trust, but verify on there. I think it's a wise adage, but uh, as we go forward, uh, outline the entire picture. Uh, we're able to do so many things. Uh, like right now, we're dealing with uh, debt-free capital because of the revenue picture uh, that we are in. We're able to spend money without even borrowing. Uh, yeah. Our debt goes down. We're able to invest more by simply uh, managing the revenue picture that we've got. And it's just incredibly freeing uh, place to be. Uh, it doesn't start off easy. The first two years are very nervous, but they work. They, these principles absolutely work. And that's what I think uh, where, where, where our principles and foundation and success in North Carolina is really being. So, Daniel, thank you for having us. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much, Representative Arp. Thank you for your leadership on this issue and uh, for stepping uh, into public service. Uh, we, we, need, we need lots more folks like you. So thank you uh, for that and for sharing some of your wisdom today and Brian as well. And uh, you've been, uh, you and the John Locke Foundation have been a great partner on uh, so many issues. And uh, like I said, for, for those watching, if you haven't read Brian's piece on the Pelican Institute website, uh, make sure you go do that. Um, right as soon as we wrap up here. So gentlemen, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Well, we are wrapping up another, uh, another episode here of the Pelicast. I thank you for joining us. One final note, um, you know, let's remember there are still folks uh, across Louisiana struggling with uh, water and electricity. So if you can donate and join the cause and uh, you know, especially our, our friends in uh, in Shreveport and other places around the state are still in need uh, of your help. So keep that in mind and, and keep those our neighbors in mind as, as they struggle through this. Um, we can help and, and lots of opportunities to get involved and, and help our neighbors all over. So thank you very much. This is going to be uh, certainly not the last time we talk about tax reform. Uh, so please continue to engage. Join us. Join the conversation in the comments and share this around to you. Thank you.
to your your lawmaker. He, he or she may uh, may very much like to hear uh, this story. So thanks thanks very much. Have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you next time on the Pellcast.